Hi, this is Michael Altos, and this is our last recording about neurophysiology, and this is part six. We're going to move to a different part of the body, the eye, and cover a few assorted topics. First, some quick anatomy. The eye has a fluid system. We see here the front of the eye, where the cornea is. Behind it, we have the aqueous humor. It is in front of the lens. The fluid flows freely and is constantly formed within the eye. It flows through the pupil into this anterior chamber in front of the lens and then exits in this angle between the iris and the cornea. It then empties into the extraocular veins. This is what they measure when they measure intraocular pressure with that puff of air that they poke, puff into your eye at the eye doctor. Usually intraocular pressure is about 12 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Separately from the aqueous humor is the vitreous humor. This is a gelatinous mass that is behind the lens. Glaucoma is an increase in intraocular pressure. When intraocular pressure is chronically greater than 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury, patients can lose vision due to compression and ischemia of the retinal cells. The most common type of glaucoma is called open angle glaucoma, again referring to this drainage angle here. In open angle, the anterior chamber angle is open and the humor can flow freely, the aqueous humor can flow freely, and the treatment is usually with medications or surgery. Less common is angle closure or closed angle glaucoma. In these patients, the angle is obstructed, either acutely or chronically. These patients will have pain, vision changes, headache, and elevated intraocular pressure. These are the patients that if you dilate their pupil, like with scopolamine, it can worsen the problem. As that iris dilates and thickens, you can precipitate acute angle closure in these patients. And they need urgent treatment with medications or surgery. Next, the oculocardiac reflex. Patients can have cardiac dysrhythmias, including bradycardia, sinus arrest, or ventricular fibrillation, in response to stimulus of the eye, traction on the extraocular muscles, pressure on the eyeball, or administration of a retrobulbar block. It's most common in pediatric patients who are having strabismus surgery, but it can occur in any age group. The treatment of the oculocardiac reflex is usually an IV anticholinergic medication like atropine or glycopyrrolate. Obviously, caution should be used in those who have coronary disease because of the tachycardia. Should patients having eye surgery be given prophylactic anticholinergics? This is controversial, but we should certainly be vigilant and watch for it and be prepared to treat it during eye surgery. The reflex does eventually fatigue or self-extinguish with repeated traction on the extraocular muscles. The last topic we'd like to cover is body temperature regulation. The normal body temperature, core body temperature, is somewhere in the range of 36 to 37 and a half degrees centigrade. The body has a set point and it works very hard to maintain temperature at that set point. Patients who have spinal cord injury, by the way, may be unable to implement a lot of these reflexes and that's one of the reasons they need extra help staying warm. How does your body produce heat? Well, the basal metabolism of cells generates heat. Muscle activity generates heat, and if you don't have muscle activity, the body will start to shiver and increase muscle tone in order to generate heat. However, shivering also consumes quite a lot of oxygen, and this could be dangerous in patients who have coronary ischemia, or who are at risk for coronary ischemia, for whom their oxygen supply versus demand needs to be kept carefully in balance. The body can also create heat by metabolism associated with hormones or sympathetic stimulation, and digestion and absorption of food also has a thermogenic effect. That's how your body gains heat. How does it lose heat? Most heat loss is due to radiation. The skin is designed to be a heat radiator, and your body can vary the rate of blood flow to your skin from zero to as much as 30% of cardiac output. This allows heat to be conducted from core tissues to the surface of the skin 
and radiate heat to the air surrounding. In fact, this can occur throughout the skin, or if just one part of the skin is being heated or cooled, the body can send cardiac output preferably to that part of the body. Conduction is direct movement of heat from one substance to another. So anything that's in contact directly with the body, whether it's air or other surfaces. Convection is the phenomenon that heated air is replaced with fresh unheated air. And this increases the cooling effect of conduction. So you conduct heat to the air, that warmed air rises, new cool air comes in, and conduction continues. Clothing helps decrease heat loss due to conduction and convection, as long as the clothing is dry. It helps trap air and maintain a warm surrounding environment. Evaporation is loss of heat when water evaporates from body surfaces. This includes any insensible evaporation from the skin and the lungs, as well as sweating. This is the only way the body is able to lose heat if ambient temperature is greater than body temperature. Hypothermia is defined as a core body temperature of less than 36 degrees centigrade. It can occur during general or regional anesthesia due to inhibition of thermoregulation and exposure to the cool OR environment. Cool IV fluids and blood products can also worsen hyperthermia, hypothermia. And while risk does increase as surgery duration increases, most heat loss occurs in the first hour of anesthesia. So even short cases put patients at risk for hypothermia. When patients become hypothermic, they have increased sympathetic discharge, which can lead to cardiac arrhythmias or ischemia, We've already talked about shivering, which increases your oxygen consumption by as much as fivefold. Your immune response is inhibited when you're hypothermic, which increases risk of wound infection. Patients have increased risk of bleeding as platelet dysfunction occurs at low temperatures. Metabolism decreases and renal function goes down, which can lead to prolonged recovery from anesthetic agents. And the oxygen hemoglobin curve shifts to the left. And so we should make every effort to avoid hypothermia in the operating room. Fever is when the body increases its set point. A pyogen is a substance that increases the set point, and it's usually released by some sort of infectious pathogen or a damaged tissue. And so now the body is using its above reflexes, like shivering or chills, in order to increase its temperature to reach the new set point. Now, since the set point has been increased, when the person has a fever, they don't feel hot because their elevated core temperature is equal to their set point. Hyperpyrexia is when temperature increases to the point that it causes tissue damage, and susceptible tissues include the brain, the liver, and the kidneys. This graph shows a patient with a normal body temperature an underlying condition raises their set point to, let's say, 103 Fahrenheit. The body then undergoes vasoconstriction, pyloerection, shivering, episecretion, in order to increase its body temperature. During this time, the patient feels freezing cold. That's why they're shivering. Their body is trying to achieve the set point. Then, crisis is the word that describes when the set point drops back to normal. Now that the set point is back to normal, but the patient's temperature is 103, this is what we talk about, the fever breaking. And suddenly the patient feels hot. They sweat and vasodilate in order to lose heat and get back down to their original set point again. That's it for this discussion. As always, please contact me with any questions about the material.